Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church in Monterey, California. It's going to be a good Sunday. It's good for us to be together. Uh, last Sunday, we weren't sure about all the things around us with the fires raging, but we prayed hard. And you know, the fires have been largely contained. They're at close to 50% containment in Carmel and the river fires. So we're, we're grateful to God for that. And Grateful to be here worshiping together in the midst of all of this craziness that's in the world. Uh, we reaffirm our community and we pray together and we worship together. And it's okay if you're at home in your living room or your kitchen to even sing along with the music and just come into God's presence. Uh, I want to invite you to stick around after worship uh, to log on to our Zoom fellowship, our Zoom coffee hour. We'll be doing that directly after worship. You will see the links for those in both our Facebook and our YouTube chat windows. So I hope you'll, you'll, you will do that and, and hang out with us a little bit. Bring your coffee and yourself and we'll have some good conversation. Uh, we will have uh, on Wednesday night our continuing adult Christian education opportunity with Chris Hasegawa. Chris was sick last week, so we, we missed that this past Wednesday, which means this coming Wednesday is going to be doubly good and full of all kinds of great things. So I hope you'll join us as we talk about a scriptural basis for being an ally in the struggle for justice. But for now, I invite you to just transition from getting to this moment to being in this moment. Breathe in the Spirit. Breathe out peace and let us prepare to worship God through God's gift of music. Please join with me as we call ourselves to worship using the call you will see on your screen. The Lord, the God of ages, calls us. This is holy ground. The Lord, the great I am, is with us. Let us worship God.
Isn't, isn't it a blessing? Isn't it amazing that God loves us so unconditionally, that God frees us up to be, to com- be completely honest about where we are and who we are, what we need to work on? That is uh, the nature of confession in the Reformed and Presbyterian tradition. It is an acknowledgement that God loves us, and so we can be honest about ourselves and how we are. So I invite you now to confess with me using the confession that you will see on your screen. Let us confess. God, our Redeemer, we confess that we remain captivated by sin. We seek profit and pleasure in the world, but you offer us a greater glory. We strive to reserve our way of life, but you call us to give our lives away. Forgive us, liberate us. Let us be no longer bound by sin, but released, restored, set free to worship and serve you in freedom through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And in the silence, I invite you to take a few moments and to be honest with the God who loves you. And together, let the people of God say, Amen. Friends, God loves you completely, totally, unconditionally. We celebrate in our baptisms that we are now members of the covenant community, that God's grace has poured over us all, refreshing, cleansing, making all things new. Celebrate the good news of the gospel, that in Jesus Christ, you are already forgiven. And may the peace of Christ be with you. Take a moment now to share that peace one with another. And uh, check out the chat boxes in our Facebook and our YouTube feeds for our virtual friendship pad. Sign in. Let us know you were here. Let us know if there are things that we can be praying about for you. We look forward to making those connections. Let us join together as we pray for understanding. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone. Let the heavenly food of the scripture we are about to hear nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. 
The first reading comes from Paul's letter to the Roman believers. Paul exhorts Christians to love and good deeds. Let us listen for holy wisdom. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Holy wisdom, holy words. Thanks be to God. Oh, hi, I'm writing a letter. Do you ever write a letter to someone or receive a letter in the mail? Today, we get to read part of a letter that was written from Paul to the church in Rome. Let's imagine that he is writing the letter to us. Hmm. <gasps> Look, I think we've got mail. Let's see what it says. Dear children, I have been thinking a lot about what it means to follow Jesus. Here are some things that will help others know you are a Christian. Bless those who are mean to you. Be happy when others are happy, but sad when they're sad. Be a peacemaker. And don't judge others. That's God's job. Give food and water to people who need them. And show love to everyone. Your friend, Paul. Now, some of those things sound hard. Like blessing those who are mean to you. Or being a peacemaker. Or showing love to everyone. Everyone, it's not always easy to be a Christian, but it's the very best way to live. Think about something you can do this week to show love to others. I know one thing you could do would be to send a letter just like Paul did. Who would love to receive a letter from you? Grandparent, a friend, a neighbor, if you can't write yet, draw them a picture. I know. Let's put this in the mail.
take some time this week to send a letter to someone who needs cheering up. You'll be glad you did, and so will they. The second scripture reading from this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew in the 16th chapter, starting at the 21st verse. Let us listen together for holy wisdom. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day rise. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God, forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone wants to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God.
Not so very long ago, I read about an ad campaign at another Presbyterian church on the other coast. The church wanted better attendance, like, like most churches do. They wanted more people in their pews. And so they went out and they hired an advertising firm, which in Presbyterian terms is only marginally better than forming a committee. Now, this ad agency did its research. They checked into trends and preferences and where young people were, and then they suggested their big suggestion was this, that the church should get rid of all of the crosses. No matter where they were, in the sanctuary, the fellowship hall, wherever they were on church campus, all of the crosses should be done away with. Because, well, frankly, the crosses, they said, might send a negative message to prospective young worshipers. Just get rid of the crosses. What do you think? You think that's a good idea? I don't. To me, it seems to be a spectacularly bad idea. The cross, as offensive as it might be, and as misused as it has been and misrepresented over the years, it's still at the heart of who we are as Christians. It's still at the heart of most Christian faith, whether it's Catholic, Protestant, Reformed, Presbyterian, Baptist. The cross is right at the heart of what we do, right? So I think it's probably a bad idea to just try to erase it and to erase its story. Because the truth is, sometimes hard stories are the stories we need. I've told some of you this story before about how when I was in seminary, uh, we were very close to the Christian Book Distributor Warehouse, CBD. Now, four times a year, the Christian Book Distributor Warehouse in New England has a big warehouse sale. You can come right to their warehouse and purchase things right out of the warehouse. Normally, it's all mail order stuff, but four times a year so that they could thin through their, their inventory, you could go and you could buy books right out of the warehouse shelves. Uh, and Christians would line up in the wee morning hours to get as close as possible when the doors uh, would open so they could be the first ones in. You would have thought it was these, these Christian books and classics were the equivalent of, of new iPhones and new technology. People would be camped out overnight trying to get into the warehouse first. I remember one time, a friend of mine came out of the warehouse shaking his head. He was clearly perplexed, a little bit upset, and I asked him, what, what's going on? And he told me that he had been wandering the aisles, keeping his eyes out for a deal, when he came across the children's book section. And in the children's book section, there was a woman asking a clerk about a pop-up book, a storybook for her child. It seems that she wanted to have a nice Easter book, a nice Easter story to put in her, her daughter's Easter basket. But her statement to the clerk flabbergasted us both, and she said, don't you have one with a happier ending? I mean, he dies in all of these. Which, of course, you know, read the rest of the story, right? There is a happy ending, but you're also missing the point. It seems to me she was missing the entire point of the cross and of sacrifice. That, that she was looking for a feel-good spirituality for an Easter basket that required as little of her and her family as possible. But that's not the way of the cross, is it? That's not the way of discipleship. Christianity, discipleship, service is not necessarily an easy thing. We live in a world, I would argue, in a culture really, that is basically selfish. I would say that our selfishness, our ego, is probably the foundational nature of most sinfulness. We're just, we're just inwardly focused. We're just selfish. I'm speaking mostly in terms of, of North American Christianity in this sermon, and it seems to me that a stranger visiting from another planet would likely get the idea that Christianity in America is primarily about getting all your wishes fulfilled. To the outsider, it would appear that American Christianity is about health and wealth, that our religion is focused first and foremost on what we can get from God rather than what God's gifts compel us to give to others. Douglas John Hall, a professor of theology at McGill University in Montreal, puts it this way. He writes, In North America, we are chiefly concerned with the theologia gloria rather than a theologia crucis. I know this is a term some of you have heard me use. A theologia gloria as opposed to a theologia crucis. That is to say, these are Latin terms, which are to say that we are more concerned with a triumphant faith which meets all our earthly temporal needs and sees us as victors better than everybody else, rather than with the theology of a cross, which calls us to something sacrificial in an imitation of the work of Christ. Glory 
versus suffering, right? We like the idea of glory. We don't like the idea of sacrifice. Jesus comes to this point in his ministry. He's pretty popular. People are flocking to him. He can see it all clearly laid out in front of him. He, he can see what it is that this obedience is going to require of him. And he needs for those of them around him to understand the ultimate purpose of his life. So he tells them, pulling no punches, that before, before him and before them lies Jerusalem, the cross, and death. It's going to require a theologia crucis, right? Can you imagine how surprised they must have been? I mean, Peter straight up just tells him not to do it. And Judas, I imagine, hearing this, begins to believe for the first time that maybe he's made a mistake in following Jesus. Judas, you remember, was the zealot, one of the sect of militant Jews who were advocating for the violent overthrow of the Roman Empire. His reading of the Old Testament led him to believe that the Christ, the Messiah, Jesus, in his mind, would be a mighty warrior coming to balance the scales of injustice with blood. The irony is that, in a way that the Jews never understood, that's exactly what Christ did, right? Balance the scales with blood. It's just that the blood was his own blood, right? The sacrifice was his own sacrifice. This violent death on a cross is what obedience would require of Jesus. Jesus shares this with the disciples, and through them, Jesus shares with us so that we might all realize that discipleship is not an easy thing. Discipleship is not merely listening to stories that make us feel good. It's not about having your wish list fulfilled by a God who is little more than a genie in a bottle waiting for us to unstop the cork and rub. Even while praying for the cup of this obedience to pass from him, Jesus still empties himself of self and goes to do what God requires. And in so doing, he paints for us the perfect example of what it is to follow and fulfill God's will. And contrary to popular belief, it ain't about money. And it ain't about big houses, and it's not about political influence. In fact, if we are given any influence at all, it's to be used on behalf of those who have no influence of their own. It's about sacrifice, not glory. It's about emptying ourselves of self and filling in the void with God. I mean, this is why Jesus responds so harshly to Peter. Peter's been listening to Jesus preach this all along. Peter, who not so long ago in an amazing moment of faith was brave enough to jump into the water and try to walk just because he could see Jesus in the distance. Peter, who just a moment ago was hailed as the rock upon which the church would be built, is now called another kind of rock, the kind of rock that sticks up out of the ground just a bit higher than the rest of the cobbles and makes you trip as you walk along. Jesus says, you make me stumble. The Greek word there is scandalon. And from that word, we get the English word scandal. So Jesus is looking at Peter and saying, you're scandalous. This idea of yours is scandalous. And it's going to make me fall if you don't stop it. So get behind me, Satan. So wrong is Peter that Jesus calls him Satan and says that he's a scandal. See, Jesus, uh, excuse me, Peter is called this because he's doing exactly what Satan did to Christ in the desert. He is tempting Jesus with something other than the will of God. He is trying to dangle in front of Christ the desire of, of humankind, the desire for comfort and safety and peace of mind that does not require one to step outside of oneself to follow where God leads. But Jesus responds, if you're going to follow me, Deny yourself. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. No crown, not wealth, no health, just the cross. Just the cross. 
Now, how many of us would choose the cross over a crown if Jesus wasn't asking? If it was just something out there in the everyday world, how often would we choose the sacrificial course over the comfortable one? There's this this story of a woman on the Titanic, and I'm told that this is a true story, although I don't know for sure. She was just taking her place in a lifeboat when she thought she might rush back to her room to retrieve some of her values. You see, they never thought in that moment that the ship was actually going to go down. A lot of them didn't even initially go to lifeboats because they thought the Titanic would never sink. They figured they would all be back inside and warm pretty quickly. She was informed that she had exactly three minutes and that she could only bring one thing. So she rushed to her stateroom and she started to rummage through things as quickly as possible. Her eye fell on a small basket of a few oranges and some apples. It had been a parting gift from a friend of hers before the journey had started. And so she had to think to herself, what would it be? This the sustenance of fruit that might be helpful to the people in the lifeboat Or would it be her diamonds and her precious jewels only good to her? Seems to those of us looking back in 2020 hindsight like like an easy answer, right? That we would, of course, choose the fruit to feed the people around us. That's an easy answer to come by in church on a Sunday morning. But to her, in that moment, it was a turning point for her life. Just a few days earlier, had she been asked to choose, she would have left the fruit rotting on the closet floor. But but now she saw what was really essential and needed for life. And it required her to leave behind those things of the world that she had thought for so long would sustain her and make her important. In a way, that's the life that Christ calls us to. A life that denies our earthly desires. A life that reaches through our selfishness to take up the cross daily and do what God desires. And what does the Lord require of you, O human? But to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. It's that simple, and it's just that hard. So Christian, let go of the things of this world and take up your cross and follow Jesus. Amen.
I'd like to ask you to do two things right now, to give of your stuff and to give of yourself. Give of yourself by looking in the comments section on our Facebook and YouTube feeds here right now. It should be pinned, I guess. If it's not, you can scroll and find it, but it's a, a link to our online friendship pad. You can let us know that you are here and how we can be praying for you or, or how we can make a connection with you. So do that. And the other thing is to, to give of your, your finances, of your stuff, to put your heart and your treasure in the same place and, and say yes and amen to the ministries that the church is doing. You can do that. Uh, by mailing in a check, uh, or you can go online to our website and click on the Give Now button uh, and do it that way. Uh, you have been faithful in doing it so far, and I'm confident that you will continue into the future. But now I invite you for a moment uh, to stop and to come to the foot of the cross in prayer with me. Let us pray. Lord, you are an amazing God a great God above all gods, above all ideas, above all commitments and passions. You rise above it all. We look out over this creation. We see the wind uh, move across the bay and the waves come in and the, the seals and the otters jump and the dolphins swim and, and the whales breaching and, and we hear them dancing to the tune of your creation. And we're amazed. What are we, Lord, that you would consider us? What are we that you would make us in such a way that we could enjoy that and be inspired by it and relish it? So not only you are you an amazing, awe-inspiring God, you are a God of ultimate and infinite love to have created us that way. And we thank you for it. We confess, Lord, that we don't always live the lives that we should live um, that we have not always sought out justice. We have not always used our privilege to other people's advantage. We confess, Lord, that when bad things happen, uh, it's easy for us to shut our door and sit in our living room and just pretend like it's not out there. Help us, Lord, as your people, to take up our crosses, to do things that are hard, to make sacrifices for your creation, for your children. We look around the world and there's a lot going on. It's a, it's a political season and candidates are arguing and people are yelling. Remind us of kindness and compassion. Remind us of, of justice. Remind us of how you champion the least among us and help us to do the same. We pray for folks who've been displaced by these fires who are still not sure the disposition of their homes. We give you thanks that Folks have found lodging and a safe place to land as they await whatever news comes. We pray, Lord, that you will help us understand our role of charity and compassion in the days and weeks that follow. And of course, in the middle of all of the things that happen in a regular year, Lord, there is this worldwide pandemic. And people are still scared and still sick and not sure what it all means. Help us to respond one to another in love and compassion, and kindness. And hear us now, Lord, as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, discipleship is not easy. Being a Christian is not about health and wealth. It's not about getting all of your wishes fulfilled. It's about following a God who loved you completely and 100% totally, sacrificially, and then taking that love and loving in the same way. That's not always easy. That's what it means to take up the cross and to follow. I pray that you will be able to do that as you go forth this week and into all weeks. And now, may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with us and all those we love and all those Jesus calls us to love now and forevermore. Amen. And uh, please don't forget to sign our friendship pad to let us know you were here. And then also join us for our virtual Zoom coffee hour in just a few minutes. Hope to see you there.